This lecture is about the physical examination of knee. So starting from the standing examination, first we'll look for the frontal alignment. So the patient is viewed from the behind using a plumb line that bisects the his and a vertical and a horizontal asymmetries are noted in the frontal plane. So we have to look for the positions of a neuracular tubercles, medial medulli, fibular heights, popliteal and the gluteal floors, greater to candor and the posterior superior iliac spine as well as the iliac crest. So note abnormal or the asymmetric valgus and a varus angulation in a standing examination. So the knee is normally positioned in a slight genoval valgum because the medial condyle extends further distally than the lateral condyle. So excessive genoval valgum may be documented by measuring the distance between the medial medulli with the medial femoral condyles in a contact and an excessive genovarum is noted by measuring the intercondylar distance at the knee with the medial medulli in contact. Next is a transverse sutati alignment. So the patient is viewed from the front with the feet in a normal stance width and appointed outward from 5 to 10 degree from a sagittal plane. If there is a squatting patella, this may indicate that the medial femora or the lateral tibial torsion. So the normal patella posture for exerting deacceleration forces in the functional position of 45 degree knee flexion places the patella articular surface squarely against the inferior femur. A lower posture represents the patella badger and a higher posture represents the patella alta. So normally the length of the patella and the patella tendon should be roughly equal. So when viewed from the side, if there is a patella alta, so when you view from the side, a camel or a dumb hum, double hum may appear in resulting from the uncovered infrapatella fat pad. So patella alta makes the patella less efficient in exerting normal forces and lateral displacement occurs easily. Next is the interior posterior alignment. So the patient is viewed from the side and a plumb line facilitates assessment and a measure of the deviations. If the plumb line is one centimeter interior to the lateral malleolus and the lateral femoral condyle should be slightly posterior to the plumb line. So ab abnormal angulation in the sagittal plane can be documented by measuring the atomic length mass from the plum line. So next is a sitting examination. So in sitting examination, first we check the femoral patella alignment. So in this, we assess the position and the size of the patella. So a small and a high riding patella and an outward facing patella may be disposed to a lateral patella tracking disorder. So a lateral facing patella suggests that the medial femoral condyle is considerably longer than the lateral condyle. This is also likely to be associated with the valgus angulation when the knee is straight. So the inferior pole of the patella should be about the level with the femoro-tibial joint line. Next, we have to check the alignment of the femoro-tibial joint. So assess the position of a tibial tubercle with respect to the patella in the sitting position, that is the knees will be bent. So the tubercle position too far medially may represent the posterior media capsular tightness as may occur with the healing of a sprain or the rupture of one of the cruciate ligaments. Next is if the tubercle is situated too far laterally it may suggest laxity like a rupture of the posterior media capsule of a MCL. Next is a supine examination. So in this first 
legs will be straight and the valgus and avarus angulations will be measured with a goniometer. And the leg and the limb disparities are documented by measuring from the anterior superior iliac spine to the medial malleoli. Next, the knees will be bent at 60 degree and the feet will be flat on that plane. So anterior posterior femoral tibial displacements are detected by comparing the prominences of tibial tuberculum. If the PCL is ruptured, the tibia will sag behind and the tibial tubercle is less prominent and is often associated with the false positive interior draw tires for the ACL. The tibial tubercles are excessively prominent. This suggests that there is a previous osteochondrosis of the tibial apophysis present. This may lead to a high riding patella. Next is a joint integrity test. So in the joint integrity test, first one is the interior drawer test. So in interior drawer test, the patient will be in the supine position and the knee will be flexed to 90 degree and the examiner sitting on the patient's leg to stabilize the tibia. The examiner's hands are placed around the proximal tibia over the gastrocinemus and the hamstring muscles with the thumbs over the tibial plateau and the joint line. The tibia is then drawn forward on the femur. The test is positive when the interior displacement exceeds the 6 mm. If the test is positive when the tibial condyle are displaced interiorly, the usual mechanism is the posterior lateral and the posterior medial capsule and the medial and the lateral capsular ligament. If the degree of subluxation is significant, the ACL is also ruptured. Next is the flexion rotation draw test. The test is performed exactly like the straight interior draw test except the foot and the leg are first externally rotated allowing the examiner, examiner to assess the rotatory instability as well. So in each position, the examiner provides a gentle pull repeatedly in the anterior direction. So each lower extremity is tested and the results are compared. A positive in tear draw test with the foot in the external rotation indicates interior medial rotatory instability. But when the foot is in the neutral position, a positive test indicates interior lateral rotatory instability. And when the foot is in the internal rotation, a positive test indicates a cruciate tear. Next is the Lachman's test. The Lachman test is the best indicator of the ACL injury, especially the posterior lateral band. So it is essentially an interior draw test with the knee near full extension. So the test can be performed with a patient in a semi-sitting and the ankle stabilized between the examiner leg or also in the supine position. So the examiner hand stabilizes the patient femur laterally and gently applies an interior translation force on the tibia from the medial side with the other hand. The amount of interior translation is compared with the uninjured knee and the quality of the hand feel is assessed. If posterior lateral band is disturbed, the interior draw test may be negative, but the Lachman test is positive as the posterior lateral band becomes tighter as the knee approaches the extension position. Next is the passive posterior draw test. So in this, first we perform passively and then perform the actively. So passive posterior draw test, the patient is placed in the same position as the interior draw test with the hip flexed to 45 degree and the knee to 90 degree. So the unaffected legs is examined first to determine the normal degree of flexity. The foot 
is in neutral rotation and the examiner sits on the dorsum of the foot to stabilize it and the hands are used to push the tibia to and fro to reveal any backward movement of the tibia on the femur. The test is positive after the disruption of a PCL tear of the posterior capsular ligament. Next is the active posterior draw test. So for this active posterior draw test, the patient is in the same position as for the passive posterior draw test with the examiner holding the foot against the table. So, have the patient contract the quadriceps and try to extend by pushing the foot down towards the end of the table. So, if the PCL is torn, the tibia will either remain in the neutral or move slightly posteriorly. Next is a valgus stress for the medial instability. So, medial stability is secondary to the disruption of the ligaments of the medial tibiofemoral compartment and results in a various subluxation of the tibia on the femur. So, the MC laxity is best evaluated by the valgus stress perform at the 30 and a 0 degree flexion. So when the patient is supine and the knee flex to 30 degree, apply a valgus stress at the knee while lowering the leg to steady it. Repeat the test with the knee at 0 degree. If the test is positive with the knee flex to 30 degree but negative with the knee fully extended, the MCL has been damaged. If the test is positive with both the knee at 30 and as well as the full extension. Both medial capsular and the cruciate ligaments are damaged. Next is a valid test for the lateral instability. So lateral instability is caused by the disruption of a lateral compartment and the results in a valid subluxation of the tibia on the femur. So the varus stress is similar to the valgus stress test but the hands are changed to apply the varus stress to the knee and this test is done at the 30 degree flexion and the full extension. So if the test is positive with the knee flex to 30 degree but negative with the knee fully extended the LCL has been damaged to some degree. But if it is also positive in extension, this implies that there is a damage to the cruciate ligaments and the lateral capsule as well. Next is the rotatory instability. So in rotatory instability, first we will check the interior medial rotatory instability. So in interior medial rotatory instability, there is an interior subluxation of a medial tibial condyle that also move into external rotation of the femur. So interior medial rotatory instability is increased with the tear of a capsular ligament of a medial joint compartment or with the loss of a ACL or the medial meniscus. So this instability is diagnosed clinically in the presence of a positive interior draw test performed with the tibia is had in external rotation. Next is a interior lateral instability which is caused by the insufficiency of a ACL. So degree of instability is also increased when the LCL is torn. So interior lateral rotatory results in the interior subluxation of a lateral tibial plateau which also move into the internal rotation on the femur. So tests demonstrating translation of a tibia including the presence of a 90 degree positive interior draw test with the tibia held in a neutral rotation. Next is the pivot shift test. So the patient is in the supine with the knee in a full extension and the tibia of the affected knee is grabbed at the proximal tibiofibular joint by the examiner's cranial hand and the cotton hand grabs the ankle and applies the maximal internal rotation, subluxing the lateral tibial plateau. The knee is then slowly flexed at the proximal hand and applies a valgus stress to the knee. 
if the test is positive, the tension in the iliotibial band will reduce the tibia, causing a sudden backward shift. Next is the posterior lateral rotatory instability. So this follows a tear of a, uh, a great ligament complex, including a PCL, and results in the posterior subluxation and the internal rotation of the lateral tibia condyle. So first perform a reverse pivot shift test. So this test is a primary test used to assess the posterior lateral rotatory instability. So the patient lies supine with the knee straight and the examiner places one hand around the patient's ankle and places the foot against the examiner pelvis. So beginning at 80 degree flexion with the leg externally rotated and a slight valgus force applies. Then the leg is slowly brought into extension. If the test is positive, the lateral tibial plateau will suddenly move forward and internally rotate at about 20 degree flexion. Next is the dial test. So the dial test or the posterior lateral rotation test. So the dial test is done at 30 and 90 degree knee flexion and it has been found to provide a good assessment of a posterior lateral knee injury. So the, uh, this task can be performed in either pawn or in supine position. If in the supine position, the knee will be flexed over the treatment table and the examiner stabilize the thigh. The foot is then used to apply a rotation force through the foot and the ankle. The examiner then look for the amount of external rotation of the tibial tubercle and compare it with the contralateral side. If there is an increase of 100 to 150 degree of external rotation when compared with the opposite side, this indicates a posterior lateral knee injury.